So today we're going to talk about pain with relation to pain as embolia. Ramachandran in chapter 10, I believe, talks about pain as embolia as kind of being a thing that corroborated his theory of laughter. I'm not going to talk about the theory of laughter, but I read a little bit into pain as embolia and thought it was interesting, so I kind of just ran with that. And then upon doing research on asymbolia, I realized that without understanding what pain is in a, in a neurological sense, the pain asymbolia doesn't really make sense. And it's really rare too, so there's not a lot of reported cases of it. But So we're going to start with what is pain. So from a neurophysiological standpoint, pain can be understood by understanding the pathways of pain. So, extraoceptive signals originate in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and the medulla. This is where the second order neurons obtain synaptic information. Um, and this input is from primary afferent neurons. So, there are two kinds of relevant second order neurons. So, we have WDR, which is wide dynamic range and then we have the nociceptor specific neurons. And nociceptor specific neurons are sensory neurons that, resp that respond to potentially threatening or potentially damaging stimuli, more potentially damaging stimuli. So WDR neurons, which is the white dynamic range neurons, um, they respond to pain along a spectrum. Um, so that means that the most painful stimulus invokes um, a higher impulse frequency and then that impulse frequency is transposed to a more sensitive area of the receptive fields. But since it's not a spectrum, this also means that um, less painful stimulus invokes a lower impulse frequency and then those lower impulse frequencies are transposed to less sensitive receptor fields. Um, WDR and NS Neurons respond to numer numerous forms of noxious stimuli and have a very high discriminant capacity. But what does all of this mean? What all this means is that contact with external objects to the skin and the properties of subject objects can be transmitted to the appropriate receptor fields. Each neuron projects onto a different pathway, but both passageways converge on areas such as S1, S2, and the insular cortex. Um, the insula is the most frequently activated structure in fMRI studies. So, it's the most commonly activated brain area in MRI or fMRI studies for studying pain. So, it's make that is making it our choice topic. So what exactly is the insula responsible for? Um, insula is wildly important and a lot of very important functions happen in the insula, such as motor control, language, and homeostatic regulation. In addition to these functions, the insular cortex is involved in interoceptive awareness, pain, temperature, perception, olfactory, which is your smell, gustatory, which is your taste, and vestibular sensations, which is your sense of balance and spatial orientation for the purpose of coordinating movement with balance. So those are the more or less main functions of the insula, insular cortex. So now we're going to explore the role of the insular cortex in pain management, eventually getting to pain asymbolia. So information about the status of the organs and body tissues is passed from sensory receptors along the spinal pathway into the brainstem and up to the posterior insula. The insula is divided into anterior and posterior portions by the insular sulcus. This is where interoceptive awareness of bodily state occurs. Once the sensory information has reached the posterior insula, it is further directed to the anterior insular cortex. And that's because information within the insula goes from posterior to mid to anterior. Um, this is where 
And in the anterior cortex, this is where the mere sense of the physiological state of body is actualized. This is to say that subjective meaning is applied to the psychological state of the body. So, what happens when there's damage to the insula? Now we're going to talk about pain, ass, and bolia. Because damage to the insula is how pain, ass, and bolia comes to be. So pain, ass, and bolia patients with insular cortical damage do not withdraw from nociceptive stimuli, despite their ability to recognize the sensory features of nociceptive stimulation. Um, so this is to say that the patient has interoceptive awareness of their bodily state as occurs in the posterior insula, but do not achieve the subjective intensity of the experience as occurs in the anterior insula. Lesions encompassing the posterior insula have high likelihoods of disrupting how interoceptive information is represented. So, now there are two models for trying to explain how pain assembly came to be. No one's really sure. Um, the two models don't really agree with each other. I think the second one is more accurate. Uh, representation of what's actually happening. So, um, the degraded input model states that pain assembly can be explained by the absence of one of the two parts used in the model. So, one part is um, sensory and it can be represented by tissue, um, and then the second part is motivation or effective, and that is how we respond to stimulus such as pain. So it's postulated that pain and both pain as embolia arises from the absence of the part that motivates us to respond to pain. So this makes sense, but the lost capacity model states that as embolics are apathetic to any hazardous or threatening stimuli. They are apathetic to bodily menace regardless of the modality. So it's not specifically directed towards pain. So this is to say that pain assembly is more complicated than a lacking motivation to do anything about said pain and threats. So the big disagreement between these two theories is in the elucidation of the functional consequences afforded by the damage to the posterior insula. So as I mentioned earlier, the lost capacity model seems more plausible, but pain assembly is so rare, making it very much a mystery to scientists to this day. And that is all I have for you, so...